Shalom, Shalom. Call Halayim La Yahweh, by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem Radash. Peace and double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone. Shalom unto the elect. So, right now, through the Spirit, we're going to get into this lesson pertaining to Daniel the 11th chapter from about the 10th to the 12th verse. The main focus will be on the 12th verse and um, the pride of Esau Edom, which, you know, the history reveals that, prophecy reveals that. And everything that happened back then is being mirrored now. So it's all lessons, you know, the things that our forefathers went through, the Israelites of old, of the times of antiquity, the oppression that they dealt with, it mirrors what we go through in this modern world. The difference is now Esau has so many more tools and weapons in order to enforce it. So it's worse now. But at the same time, the Lord also gave us the Holy Spirit, so he has strengthened us. So, so as much as the enemy got more, the Lord gave us more. Through the spirit and power of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai. And that's how we have the spirit also to break down these prophecies. Because remember, Daniel didn't even have, uh, Daniel did not know about the visions, what he was, the visions that was given to him. He didn't know what, what it meant. Because these are things that happened hundreds of years before. All right, the the his he got the prophecy hundreds of years before these things actually transpi transpired, which proves the the strength of the holy scriptures and also the 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 prophecies was proved the Bible to be one hundred percent true. All right, but we're gonna grab this Daniel eleven and ten, and there's a lot of history. So you know, again, I'm not gonna break down the whole book of Daniel. That's a whole nother, uh, you know, that's a. That's a lot of history to get into, but I just want to focus on these few verses and uh, I'll briefly give a summary of, you know, what was going on. So right here you have the Syrian Wars, OK, which Daniel 11 mentions the kingdoms that would be after uh, Babylon. OK, so he goes into uh, the Persian kings and then following the Persians. It, it mentions that there would be one that would be stirred up against the realm of Greece, which we know is Xerxes the first. He came against them, lost. And then out of that situation, eventually you have who? Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, after he came to be, he expanded the Greeks territory. And once he died, his kingdom was split amongst his four generals. Okay, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus, and also Cassander. So, when we go into these Syrian wars, okay, the, the mentions in Daniel 11, all right, and this is just summing up a lot of history. So, you know, definitely do the research on this, brothers, and get into it. Lord's will at another point I can get into the whole chapter but for now just going to touch on these verses and Lord's will is edifying so this is Daniel 11 and 10 it says however the sons of the king of the north will assemble a mighty army that will advance like a flood and carry the battle as far as the enemy's fortress now you know going into this you kind of have to read the whole chapter but I'm going to summarize up up until this point you had of those four generals that Alexander's kingdom was spread to, you have two kingdoms, which is the Seleucid Empire and also the Ptolemaic Empire. OK, so when we go here, I'm just going to read this summary and then we can get into the scripture. The Syrian Wars were a series of six wars between the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, successive states to Alexander the Great's empire. During the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC over the region then called Coel Syria, one of the few avenues into Egypt. So right here, uh, this is Coel Syria. Okay. And as you can see by this map, all right, this region is closely tied in with the land of Israel because it's right, literally right there. Okay, southeast of Syria. Coel Syria is a large area and it's essential because 
this is uh, one of the main routes to get to Egypt. Okay. And you can see how close it is to the land of Israel. All right. Which at this point, you know, our land was, you know, divided up in a lot of ways. You know, the northern kingdom, this is way after the northern kingdom was already out into the Americas. So you had uh, the southern kingdom still holding strong in the land. So they were oftentimes caught in between these wars of the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire, which the king of the north will be those Seleucid kings, which depending on the verse is not just one king, it's different time periods and they would have throne names. So Seleucus was a throne name. Antiochus was a throne name. So it could be Antiochus the, the, the first, Antiochus the third, Antiochus the fourth. Uh, Ptolemy the first, Ptolemy the third, Ptolemy the fourth, you know, Ptolemy the fifth. So it goes on and on. So we got to know when we're looking into these verses who it, who it was pertaining to. So it's a lot of history, but the point being, this was the this was the region that it was being fought over, right? These wars, these Syrian wars. So now back in uh, Wikipedia, it mentions these conflicts drained the material and manpower of both parties and led to their eventual destruction and conquest by Rome and Parthia. They are briefly mentioned in the biblical books of the Maccabees, right? So what they fail to mention is that it's also in Daniel 11 because, you know, again, these scholars, they can fully break down the scriptures. You know, they have some some things they get right. A lot of the times they're wrong, though. And, you know, they don't have faith. So a lot of times when some spiritual is in the scriptures, they'll try to explain it away or give another reason for it. But ultimately, they don't have the gift of faith that the Lord gave us. And that's why we say we have 100 percent truth, because we can break down all of these scriptures through the spirit and power of Yahweh. So the, the verses that we're going to read is pertaining to the fourth Syrian war. Again, a lot of history, a lot to go into. Uh, I would say too much to cover in just one video. So that was the summary. So we're just going to get into this history. It says the fourth Syrian war, which that pertained to the battle of Raphia, which is um, considered the largest battle of the Syrian wars. One of the largest battles, if not the largest, it says upon taking the Seleucid throne in 223 BC, Antiochus III the Great set himself the task of restoring the lost imperial possession of Seleucus the first Nic Nicator, which is the first one of the Seleucid line, right? Which extended from the Greco-Bactrian kingdom in the east, the Hellens port in the north, and Syria in the south. Okay, so they essentially wanted claims to, to these lands, specifically Seleucia, and after Alexander's death, they were fighting. And this shows to show you Esau's greed. You know, Esau's always been a greedy bastard. And here it is. They could have found a way to work together and found a way to make it work, work. But because of their greed, you know, they just had to have this part. You know, they just had to have this one area and it ended up draining them both and setting them up to fall. You see, because and this is what Esau does now. Look at how they argue. Here it is. This is their kingdom. This is their rulership. And they can't even get on on the same accord. They're always constantly arguing. They're always constantly going back and forth. So there's nothing new under the sun. But it says by 20, 221 BC, he had reestablished Seleucid control over Media and Persia, which had been in rebellion. And again, you know, a lot of these leaders of the Ptolemaic and Seleucid empires, they would try to befriend Jake or they would make an alliance for a short time and then it will get destroyed which we're going to get into that pertaining to ptolemy the fourth philippator okay but it says by 221 bc he had reestablished seleucid control over media and persia which had been in rebellion the ambitious king turned his eyes towards syria and egypt so that's referring to who antiochus the third the great which is the son well we could we could just briefly read about him Okay, this is him. Yeah, Basilius Megas. Okay, which is uh, it means great king. Okay, that was a, a a name that he had. Okay, Antiochus the third the great. 
and it mentions okay, going into Antiochus the third the great uh, just to get his his line all right yeah his uh, his predecessor was Seleucus the third Seranus which was his older brother and uh, before that was their father which was Seleucus the second Callinicus right here you go Seleucus the second Callinicus so uh, the reason why we're bringing that out is to explain and, get, and uh, break down Daniel 11 and 10. It says, but his son shall be stirred up. So who is the his sons? Seleucus II Callinicus. Okay, which there's a whole story and, you know, a lot that went on pertaining to him. But for the sake of this video and just to, you know, get straight to the point, not going to get into all that. But he was the father of these two sons, which was Seleucus the Third, um, Seranus, and Antiochus the Third, the Great. So they were stirred up, all right, and they were stirred up in order to do what? In order to wage war. So it says, however, Daniel eleven and ten. However, the sons of the king of the north, okay, which again Seleucus the Third, Seranus, and Antiochus the Third, the Great, which Antiochus the Third, the Great. They both were preparing for war, um, but Antiochus III the Great, once he took the throne after his older brother's death, he's the one that actually went through with it. So it says, however, the sons of the king of the north will assemble a mighty army that will advance like a flood and carry the battle as far as the enemy's fortress. Meaning that they assembled an army and they went to go wage war against the king of the south. And who is the king of the south? At this point, Antiochus the Third, the Great, goes up against who? Ptolemy the Fourth, Philippator. Okay, so now it's we're gonna get into him, which this with this lesson is primarily re revolving around him and what he did, and how it pertained to our people. All right, the Israelites, which at this time was the Southern Kingdom. It says, then in a rage, the king of the South will rally against the vast forces assembled by the king of the North and will defeat them. Which, and this is just to show you how accurate the scriptures are and how pinpoint everything is, man. This is exactly how it played out. Okay, so we're going to read this about the fourth Syrian war. It said Egypt. So we read that ambitious king turned his eye towards Syria and Egypt, which we, re we just read about him. Antiochus III, the great. All right, which is of that Seleucid line. So it says, Egypt had been significantly weakened by court intrigue and public un public unrest. The rule of the newly inaugurated Ptolemy IV Philippator, reigned 221 to 204 BC, began with the murder of Queen Mother Berenice II. The young king quickly fell under the absolute influence of imperial courtiers. His ministers used their absolute power in their own self-interest to the people's great chagrin. Well, basically, it was frustration of the people because it was a power vacuum. And Ptolemy IV Philippator ended up filling that vacuum. All right. But he was he had a lot of other influences, which had their own greed involved, which, you know, this is how it is with Esau. You know, so it says Antiochus sought to take advantage of this chaotic situation. Right. So. Antiochus III the Great, seeing that it was problems with the Ptolemaic dynasty, he sought to invade. This is after an invasion in, in 221 BC failed to launch, he finally began the Fourth Syrian War in 219 BC. He recaptured Seleucia Pieria, as well as cities in Phoenicia, amongst them Tyre. Rather than promptly invading Egypt, Antiochus waited in Phoenicia for over a year, consolidating his new territories and listening to diplomatic proposals from the Ptolemaic kingdom. So he took some he took some Ptolemaic territories and then he waited it out to see what kind of agreement he could come to. Right. Meanwhile, Ptolemy's minister Sosibius began recruiting and training an army. He recruited not only from the local Greek population, as Hellenistic armies generally were, but also from the native Egyptians, which were Hamites. All right. Which they are of of the nation of Matazarium. All right. Matazarium is Egypt. OK, so he had Edomites, 
you know, it was a mix of different nations. And also, he had Hamites enrolling at least 30,000 natives as Phalangites, which this would come back to bite them in the ass. But that's what they did at the time. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So it says this innovation paid off, but it would eventually have dire consequences for Ptolemaic stability. In the summer of 217 BC, Ptolemy engaged and defeated the long delayed Antiochus in the Battle of Raphia. So that's when we look into the Battle of Raphia real quick. It says the Battle of Raphia was fought on 22nd of June, 217 BC, near modern Rafa between the forces of Ptolemy IV, Philippator. Greek king and pharaoh of Ptolemaic Egypt and Antiochus III the Great, which we're about to read about this. All right, this is the fourth Syrian war. So now Daniel 11 and 11 and the king of the south. Right, the, then in a rage, the king of the south will rally against the vast forces assembled by the king of the north and will defeat them. So boom, pinpoint accurate. That's what happened. So now when this guy, you know, going on to the next phase, all right. It says after the enemy army is swept away, so Antiochus the third, the great, his forces are defeated and he has to retreat. The king of the south will be filled with pride and will execute many thousands of his enemies. So, so he was filled with pride. And who was on the receiving end of his rage and his madness? Well, we're going to find out in an account in Third Maccabees that it was us. But his successes will be short lived, right? Because when he had an opportunity to advance on Antiochus the third the great and get more of a foothold he just kind of let it go because he wasn't really much for war you know he was more so just wanted to enjoy the pleasures of life according to the historians so so once this battle of Rafi is done the Seleucid side loses and the Ptolemaic side is the is the victors so once they get into power okay we're going to find out what uh, Ptolemy the fourth Philippator did so this is a uh, third Maccabees one all right and it mentions all this history so you can see man the scriptures have history okay the scriptures are the, is the is the best historical um source that you're gonna find. So third Maccabees one, it mentions the Battle of Raphia. Now Ptolemy Philippator learned from those who had returned that Antiochus had captured some of Ptolemy's territory. Ptolemy gave orders to all his forces, foot soldiers and mounted soldiers to break camp, along with all his forces and accompanied by his sister Arsino. He set out for the region of Raphia where Antiochus troops had set up camp. Now we already read about that, the Battle of Raphia, which we know the result. Okay, they told him he's won. Now, we're going to see what happened, and this is just to go into Esau's pride. Now, before I even get that, let's grab this scripture. Because now is the same sentiment that Esau has. Because he cannot, we're telling him that they are not a part of this. They can never be a part of this. This third temple that's being built, all right? We're telling them once again, which this is the same. We're going to get into the story. I don't want to jump the gun, but essentially they can't be a part of this third temple. Proverbs 16 and 18, pride go up before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. So that's the pride of Esau. He thinks that because he's been put in a position of power that nothing is off limits to him. But what he's finding out now is that he is actually profane. He's outside of the temple. He has been able to conquer and do all these things and everyone has been subjected to him. But this is where the Lord is drawing the line. You can't touch this. And it's dealing with his men. All right. You can't be a part of this holy um, gathering. OK. And he doesn't like that because, you know, he doesn't like to be told no. So. That's what happened with this man, which we're going to get into it some more. All right. So that was his pride. Right. So second, uh, third Maccabees eight, one and eight, it says the Jews has sent elders and members of the council to greet him, to bring gifts of friendship and to congratulate him on recent events. As a result, he was even more eager to come to them as soon as possible. So, you know, essentially 
Jacob supplanting because, you know, they wanted to make peace, at least so that they knew that, all right, this guy has a lot, a big army. He just won this victory and we want to at least, you know, have a show of goodwill to where, you know, we can at least have some type of peace. All right. So he traveled to Jerusalem, sacrificed to the Supreme God, made thank offerings and did what was appropriate for the temple. So Esau is walking the walk uh, or talking the talk, so to speak. Right. But let's see, you know, let's see what happens. As he entered the temple, he was struck with amazement at its brilliance and beauty. So he goes into the temple and he sees, you know, the glory of it and um, the beauty of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai's temple. Okay. And as he admired the orderly arrangement of the temple, he conceived a notion to enter into the holy place. So, you know, here it is. You know, first of all, it's, this, this devil got way further than he was even supposed to be. But again, you know, they were trying to be diplomatic back then, knowing what was at stake. All right. But it says, but they said that it wasn't right to do this since even those of their own nation weren't permitted to enter it. Right. Because even uh, the Levites, there's laws of pertaining to, you know, they can a lot of them couldn't even enter into the, the when we deal with the tabernacle in the wilderness, they couldn't even enter into that. A lot of them. And that's the, the, the priestly tribe, let alone the rest of the tribes couldn't even come near it. So that's why it was always an order of, you know, you have to go through an intercessor to get to the most high. It's always like that. So it shouldn't be strange that the Lord sent his son, you know, the heavenly father sent his son, Yahweh Shai, as the ultimate intercessor. But that's another lesson for another time. But it says here, but they said that it wasn't right to do this since even those of their own nation weren't permitted to enter it. Not even all the priests were allowed, but only the chief priest who was in charge overall. And he could do that so only once a year dealing with the day of atonement. All right. Where he atones for the sins of the nation of Israel. But Philip Peter wasn't at all persuaded. So he's telling them, listen, you can't go in there. This is our, our law. You know, this is, this is, you know, you know, you can supplant to a point. But then there comes a time where you got to, you know, let it be known. There's this there's things that's off limits to you. And he didn't like that again. He doesn't like it now hearing us say, you know, <laughs> you're going to be outside of this. You ain't a part of this. Either mice can't can't uh, build with us, you know. You other nations, let alone, you know, because we're telling all the nations that they have nothing to do with this. But we're especially telling Esau that he is the wicked. Not only can he not be a part of this, but he's the wicked and he's going to be in chains and shackles. So he don't like that at all. So if this man was mad back then because they told him, listen, you can't come into the Holy of Holies. <laughs> now imagine him being told now, you know, because we have. The more sure word of prophecy, we know you devils are all going into slavery. You know, we know everything pertaining to what's going to happen to you now. And we're breaking down the prophecies of everything you're doing. So imagine now how the elites feel, you know. Hey, you know, he might be amongst them. You know, he he, he, he got to be because they all come back in the reincarnation. Whether he's in the spirit realm or he's one of these leaders now. Uh, told me the fourth Philippator, he's going to receive judgment once again. All right. But it says he asked why when he was entering every other sacred place, none of those present prevented him. And someone said without thinking that he was wrong to speak of this as a sign, which ultimately that was the Lord that made him say that, you know, but they know that this guy wields a lot of power. So they're trying to tread lightly. But even if for some reason this were true, Philip Peter replied, why should I, of all people, not enter, whether they're willing or not? So now his pride comes into play and he was offended because he thinks like he wherever he goes, you know, this man fashions himself to be a god. And whether it was the king of the north, the Seleucid line or the king of the south, the Ptolemaic line, they were all devils. It's just like how you have uh, presidents now. You got, you know, Democrats, Republicans. You know, they all, you know, they're all the same wicked devils that they are. But, you know, this one comes with this angle. You know, Biden says this. Trump says that they try to befriend Jake. You know, Trump just recently had a bunch of Jake's up there uh, 
What's the man? Them niggas don't even matter, man. They, I'm not even gonna mention their names, but some foolish rappers went up there, and they were like co-signing Trump. You know, they had the grills on and the icy chains, and Trump's like, "Ooh, I like that." You know, I want to get one like that. You know, it's a bunch of, it's a it's a big joke, man. But you know, they do this because they want to try to get Jake. And this this is what's been happening. That's how we know who you Edomites are, man. That's why they took the Maccabees out of the scriptures. All right. That's why. See, hey, man, it's such a heavy saying. Got to know the history to know the mystery. And that was coined by our apostle Elder Tahar through the spirit and power of Yahweh by Shem Yashar. Because going into this history, you learn so much about why we're at the point that we're at now and what has transpired in the past to lead us here. You see? So you can see this is the same nature they have, man. You know? The Jews' reaction, it says, but the priests fell to the ground still in their sacred robes. They filled the temple with crying and tears, praying to the supreme God, Yahweh Shem Yahweh Shai, to help them and to change the mind of those who was, of the one who was wrongly imposing himself. Just Edomite. Those who were left in the city were troubled and hurried out, thinking something mysterious was happening. The young girls who had been kept secluded, so they they knew. All right, the priests are crying in the temple. Like everybody, it's, it's an uproar. You know, people started to dip out the city. Like, oh, something's about to happen. The young girls who had been kept secluded at home rushed out with their mothers. They sprinkled their hair with dust and began to fill the streets with weeping and groaning. So now, you know, once Israel cries, and, and uh, at this time. A lot of Jakes were still in their right minds. You know, this is in the process of Hellenization trying to destroy Jake in the minds of Jake. But a lot of our people still held on to that zeal. And that was all the Lord's doing because he wanted to preserve, you know, preserve Jake for the coming of the Lord Yahweh Shai. So if the Greeks had completely overcame us, then... We wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't be Joseph and Mary and them had, being able to have the Lord, Yahweh Shai. You know, they had to, the Lord had to preserve, you know, something, even though we were under captivity, but we couldn't just be utterly wiped out, you know, because the Lord, he always had mercy on us, you know, even going through history. But it says, even the young women who had just been adorned for their weddings left the bridal bedrooms that had been prepared for the marriage night. Neglecting all proper modesty, they came together in the city in a wild rush. Mothers and nurses left newborn children here and there, some in houses, some in the streets, and crowded together into the Most High Temple without looking back. So this is like a sight to see. You know, all of it at the time, everybody in the city of Israel gathering. OK, the people who assembled offered all kinds of prayers on account of the evil plot of the king. Some of the boldest sit, so it's like, yo, he's trying to go into the most high. He's trying to go into the holy of holies. This devil's trying to come in here. You know, this is the sentiment that was that was amongst Jake at the time. Some of the bolder citizens weren't going to put up with his intended plan or fulfill what he had in mind. They rallied each other to attack with weapons and to die courageously for the sake of the law of their ancestors. So now Jake and, you know, again, tying it in with that Maccabean spirit. All right, that Maccabean spirit of, you know, that zeal for Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shai and for righteousness sake. And it says creating a great, it says, uh, yeah, to die courageously for the sake of the law of their ancestors, creating a great uproar in the holy place. And essentially the Lord gave us the same zeal, but we're not over here on, on a carnal tip. But we have the zeal to defend it by making ourselves a sacrifice. All right. The old men and the elders were barely able to restrain them, but turn them at, the, at last to the same stance of prayer. So they were ready to go, go at it. But the Lord had them hold back and just pray on it. And that's a beautiful thing, because that allows the Lord to do what he does, you know, because then it gives the glory to Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai that we don't take it into our own hands. Just like, uh, you know, some of the most greatest deliverances that the Lord did, it wasn't about us taking up arms or anything like that. It was just the Lord delivering us in a miraculous way. Like when he opened up the ocean, you know, he opened up the sea and we walked through and he swallowed up Pharaoh and his hosts. Like when the, um, the Assyrians were attacking Jerusalem and 
Hezekiah and Isaiah prayed to the Lord and an angel came and slayed 185,000 of the Assyrian hosts. So these were all times where, you know, we didn't have to lift a weapon. The Lord fought our battle for us. And that's what's about to happen in these last days. And that was um, really the main thing I wanted to focus on, you know, is that Yahweh Shem Yahweh Shai is going to fight for us, man. Let's see if I could grab that real quick. Yep, Exodus 14 and 14. Yahweh shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. You see? Yahweh Ba Shem Yahweh Shai is going to fight for us, man. And we're going to hold our peace. You know, we don't have to take up arms, we don't have to be carnal. But these are beautiful accounts, you know, so it says now the crowd in front of the temple was occupied and praying, but the elders standing near the king tried in many ways to turn his arrogant mind from the scheme that he had conceived. But he being made bold and ignoring all the arguments began to make his approach determined to carry out his plan. So when those who were near him saw this, they turned together with the people to appeal to the one who was fully able to come to their aid and not to overlook this insolent transgression. An immense roar went up from the intensity and passion of the crowd's concerted shouting. So, oh, man, this is heavy. <laughs> it's a lot of jakes, man. You know, I can't get put an exact number, but you, you could imagine hundreds, if not a thousand or a few thousand, you know, crying out. Until you how about Shem Shah passionately calling on the name of the Lord. Man, you know, that's when you knew this guy was in trouble. Indeed, it seemed that not only the people, but also the walls and the entire land were echoing. Because at that time, all were prepared to accept death instead of making the holy place impure. Amen. Call hello, Yahweh, Bashem, Yahushai. So now, going into the second chapter. Okay, it says, Then the high priest Simon fell, knelt in front of the temple, extended his hands, and offered his prayer in a dignified manner. Lord, Lord, King of the heavens and masters of all creation, holy among the holy ones, only rule, ruler almighty, pay attention to us. We are being crushed by an evil and impure man, caught up in his own arrogance and power. Now, is this not exactly what's happening now? That's why I pray, man. We got to pray unto the Lord to, to take this devil out. You are the creator of all things and the just master who rules over all. You judge those who act with violence and arrogance. You destroyed those who did evil in the past, even giants. The giants trusted in their bodily strength and boldness, but you destroyed them in a great flood. The people of Sodom acted arrogantly and were notorious for their wicked deeds. You destroyed them with fire and sulfur, making them an example to others for all time. When the arrogant ruler of Egypt enslaved your holy people Israel, you tested him with many varied punishments. You made your power known. Indeed, you made known your great strength. When the ruler of Egypt pursued Israel with chariots and a multitude of people, you overwhelmed him with the depth of the sea. This is spirit because these are the things that we just went into. But those who trusted in you, the one who holds power over all creation, these people you brought safely through the sea. And when they saw your powerful work, they praised you, the almighty. Although you, King, created the whole wide earth, you chose this city and set this place apart for your name. Though you don't need anything, you made it wonderful, giving it a splendid appearance and established its border for the reputation of your great and honored name. And that's why we got to know that name of Yahweh and Yahweh Shai. Because you love the house of Israel, you promised that you would hear our prayer if we came to this holy place and prayed whenever we experience a setback or were overwhelmed with distress. Again, man, prayer. That's the that's like the main point of this whole lesson now is prayer. Indeed, you are faithful and true. So. You know. Um, I just want to go, you know, there's a lot you can read the rest of this. You know, for time's sake, I do want to close this out. But um, just going into what happened, right? What happened after this prayer? It says, Then the God who watches over all things, the first father of all, holy among the holy ones, heard this lawful prayer and scourged the one who had claimed too much for himself in his violence and arrogance. Again, Esau, you're doing the same mistake. You're claiming too much for yourself. You need to sit your ass down. But again, he's going to keep going with his pride keep going in his rage against us and the lord got something for you man you know this is the last captivity the last deliverance so you think you mean to tell me the lord ain't gonna defend his people his elect come on man 
The Most High shook him this way, and that as a reed is shaken by the wind, with the result that he lay helpless on the ground. His limbs were paralyzed, and he was unable to speak, since he, since he was struck by a just judgment. So this is clearly the judgment of the Lord. You know, the Lord's people cried out. Simon the high priest cried out. And this man was cast down right there. I mean, come on. His friends and bodyguards saw it. Now, if you ask the scholars, they'll say, well, the Jews probably made this up. This was an invention of the Jews, a later myth. Like, shut up, man. Shut your ass up, Esau. That's why you mad. Because it's you're being exposed. You know, every which way you go, you're being exposed. Your skirt is being lifted. His friends and bodyguards saw that the punishment that had seized him was severe. Fearing that even his life might fail, they quickly dragged him out since they were terror stricken. After a while, the king recovered, and even though he had been punished, he didn't change his heart and mind at all, but went away issuing bitter threats. So again, you know, and that's why it mentions, um, it, you know, it goes into all of this that he did to us. You know, we had to be branded with a, uh, uh, the ivy leaf of Di uh, Dionysius, uh, Dionysus, and you know. A bunch of things that forced our people and this is where a lot of that hellenization also originated so we were getting it from the king of the south we're getting it from the king of the north you know we were in a very tight position so when you read about daniel 11 and 12 again and when he have taken away the multitude his heart shall be lifted up he shall cast down many ten thousands. That's what we just read about. That was his heart being lifted up. He was so prideful. You know, these guys, once they would win these battles, they would think that they're the Most High himself. You see, but what they don't know is that the Most High gave you the victory to fulfill his own purpose. And you ain't shit. You're exposable. You know, the Lord just used you. You know, that the, the Lord used you as a tool, as an axe. The axe, you know what? I'm going to grab that, but let me finish this. It said, but he shall not be strengthened by it. So, again, he cast many of our, our people down. But it was beautiful how the Lord defended us in that moment. All right. Now, I'm going to close out with this. It mentions the axe boasting. Yeah, this is Isaiah 10 and 15. Shout out, axe boasts itself against him that you have there with. Right, when a lumberjack takes an axe to a tree, the axe don't turn around and say, hey, nigga, put me down. <laughs> the axe does what it's supposed to do. Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it, as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself, as if it were no wood. Right, so you ain't nothing but an axe. You ain't nothing but a tool. You ain't nothing but a piece of wood. All right? That the Lord is using... For a particular purpose. But again, these, these rulers, they get puffed up. Esau's puffed up now. Don't you know the Most High is using you so that it could be the most glorious deliverance ever for his people and his name could be magnified? That's your whole purpose. So you can be destroyed and by you rising up and raging against us, the Lord can defend us and his name will be glorified. That's the whole point. The names of Yahweh, while Yahweh Shai being glorified, man. That's what we want to see. So that's why we encourage Esau. We tell him, you know, you elites, you bankers, do your worst. You know, go ahead, implement that that mark of the beast, implement that chip. You do it, do what you gotta do because you're fulfilling the Lord's purpose either way you do it. All right, the most high is guiding you. All right. It's not just that he's allowing you to do it, he's the one guiding you to do it to your own destruction, and you can't do anything to stop it. There's nothing you could do to escape your fate. So, you know, Lord's with us is edifying. We give all praise, glory, and honor to Yahweh. By Hashem Yahweh Shai, by Hashem Rechach Shalom to the next one.